All right. Hello. Good morning to all, everyone in Pacific Standard Time and good afternoon um, to everyone else in Eastern Standard Time. My name is Edgar Castillo. I am the manager for Education Business Coalitions at ACC. I'm happy to welcome you all to today's webinar, um, Building a Higher Education Ecosystem. We will just get started in just a few minutes. Um, we're going to wait a couple more minutes for others to join the webinar today. In the meantime, I do want to let everyone know that you are all on mute. So um, uh, you won't be able to speak to us. But and also as a reminder, this webinar is will be recorded and we'll make sure it's uploaded along with any presentation materials on our website within about 24 to 48 hours. So um, just sit tight. We'll just let another minute, about two more minutes go by and uh, we'll get started with the webinar. So thank you all for joining on time and on early. All right, we'll just wait a, one more minute uh, to dial in. I still see a lot more people dialing in right now. So thank you, everybody who's re who are joining the webinar right now. We'll just get started in about, I want to say, like 30 seconds or so, and we'll begin. All right, perfect. Well, thank you, everybody. Welcome again, everyone. Um, we are happy to have you here today for today's webinar on building a higher education ecosystem. We have a great panel of speakers today, but before we get started and turn the program over, we have a few housekeeping notes that we just want to um, get clear to everybody. First, we have reserved time for questions at the end of the webinar. If you have any questions, please ask them using the question function in the webinar access panel. Uh, the question box is in the upper right-hand corner of your screen in that access panel. Just type in your questions there and we will read them aloud uh, when it comes to the Q&A portion of the webinar. Uh, so please feel free to start beginning uh, typing in questions as soon as uh, the presentation starts going. Second, we are playing a video later on in this webinar. The audio for this video will come out of the speakers of your computer as opposed to your phone. So when we get to the video portion of this webinar, just make sure the volume of your speakers for your computer is up and you'll be able to listen to it. If anyone who's watching the recording of this webinar are able to see uh, the YouTube link in the bio, for this webinar that will take you to the video that we are sharing today in the webinar. Uh, lastly, this webinar will take about an hour and is being recorded. So check the ACC website within the next few days for the recording and other presentation materials that we uh, present here today. So with that, I would like to introduce both of our speakers on today's webinar. So firstly, our first speaker, William Moses, William Bill Moses, serves as Managing Director for the Kresge's Foundation's Education Program, which supports post-secondary access and success for low-income, first-generation, and underrepresented students. The key architect of Kresge's Education Programming, Bill leads a team's continuum of domestic and international grant activities, from developing program strategy, reviewing preliminary ideas, and helping grantees develop proposals or initiatives to awarding funding and monitoring existing grants. And our second speaker today is Greg Handel, who is Vice President of Education and Talent for the Detroit Regional Chamber. 
In this role, he's responsible for the Chamber's efforts to ensure that employers in the region have access to talent needed to thrive in the 21st century global environment. Handel oversees the development and advocacy of the Chamber's public education policy and is also responsible for the Detroit Promise, which guarantees a tuition-free path to an associate's degree for every graduate attending a Detroit high school. He also directs other chamber initiatives designed to increase education attainment throughout the region and recruit and prepare candidates to serve on charter school boards. Um, so with that, thank you both for coming here and presenting on this webinar today. And I would like to hand uh, the uh, microphone over to Bill Moses. Great, thank you, Edgar. And thank all of you for joining us today on uh, this ACCE webinar. Uh, as Edgar said, I'm Bill Moses. I'm Managing Director for Kresge's Education Team. And you're looking at a photograph of uh, some of my colleagues and I um, celebrating college uh, sort of selection day in May a couple of years ago. Um, going to the next slide, what we're going to talk about today is um, looking at the sort of what Kresge is, a little bit about us, our uh, team strategy, our work in cities, and the concept of the higher education ecosystem, some early takeaways that we've had, some lessons we've learned, and some recommendations. Going to the next slide, um, the Kresge Foundation is a national private foundation based in Detroit, and I'm here actually with Greg Handel at the Detroit Regional Chamber's um, headquarters on the 18th floor, I believe, in downtown Detroit. Um, our goal as a foundation is to expand opportunities in American cities. And um, we have a, about a $3.6 billion endowment, and we make about $160 million a year annually in um, uh, grants to foster economic and social change. We have um, uh, programs in arts and culture, Detroit, the environment, health, uh, human services, education, and we just added something called American Cities. Plus, we have social investments practice, which is where we use loans instead of grants to um, help meet our goals. Um, why don't we go to the next slide? Our education team strategy uh, seeks to uh, focus on increasing post-secondary attainment while eliminating gaps for low-income students and students of color in the United States and South Africa. Um, if we go to the next slide, we can talk a little bit about what I think is critically important for our work, and I think probably for most of you. Um, when you think about post-secondary education, there are ec obvious economic benefits, there are individual benefits, and there are collective benefits. The um, biggest economic benefit is that right now, about 60% of all uh, jobs in the United States require some kind of post-secondary education. And when I say college, I actually also, I mean post-secondary in general. So please don't get confused. When I say college, I mean BAs, I mean associate degrees, and I mean some um, uh, certificates and diplomas, high quality certificates and diplomas. So I'm not just exclusively talking about one kind or another. Um, but in, in any case, there are about three or four million people, or three or four million jobs that are being unfilled right now because people don't have those skills. And those jobs are either going unfilled, they're being uh, uh, filled by people who are uh, coming here on H1B visas, or they're going to be replaced by technology. And so the idea is how do we get more people uh, trained so they can take up those jobs so that American businesses and regional um, uh, uh, businesses can compete better either nationally or globally uh, to be successful. Now, on individual benefits, the most obvious benefits are that people um, if they have a college degree, uh, they're more likely to have uh, better employment outcomes. That is, they are less likely to be unemployed during the Great Recession. I think that the peak unemployment rate for people with BAs is maybe 6% or so. So there's quite an advantage, obviously, of having a BA or a post-secondary credential. And in fact, if you think of it in terms of uh, earning, on average, if you have a BA, you're going to make a million dollars more over your lifetime than someone who uh, just has a high school diploma and a $250,000 uh, income premium for people with associate degrees. So it, it, the, the question is, is college worth it? It definitely is worth it uh, because you're going to earn back much more than you would spend to get that degree if you finish, That's, which is a critical aspect of that. But there are also collective benefits. 
Um, so research done by economists shows that a one percentage point increase in degree holders in a community is associated with almost $900 in annual per capita income in the community. So if you go from 35% BA holders to 36% BA holders, and this research was just about BA, by the way, um, you're going to see everybody in the community on average see their incomes go up at that level. And so this really is a rising tide that lifts all boats. Other things that are beneficial for our community is you're going to see increased civic participation, more volunteerism, more voting. You're also going to see a decrease in criminal justice involvement, and people are going to live longer and healthier lives. So there really are wonderful um, uh, sort of collective and public benefits, there are wonderful individual benefits, and there are critical economic needs that are met by having more people get a better uh, education. Looking at the next slide, let me tell you a little bit about our focus and our strategy. So we have three uh, sort of strategies within our goal of promoting post-secondary access and success for low-income, first-generation, underrepresented students, particularly African-Americans, Latinos, Native Americans, Pacific Islanders, and other groups that have tended to not have the college attainment rates of the nation as a whole. And the reason we focus on that is precisely because of that gap. If we want to remain a competitive nation, and we want to have opportunities for the American dream, we have to make sure that everybody is part of uh, this attainment agenda, or else we can't get there. The math just won't work. So the first strategy is to build the capacity of the institutions that focus on our students. That's really determined by where our students are going. Most low-income students, the most Americans, are going to community colleges, they're going to minority-serving institutions, which is a federal designation, and they're going to um, large uh, public universities and colleges, although not typically the flagships. We're talking about those other institutions. And it's critically important that those institutions not only serve those students, they're already doing that, but serve them well. That's where some of these colleges don't quite meet the mark. So how can we get them uh, equipped to better serve today's students who are typically non-traditional? I'll talk a little bit more about what that means for non-traditional students in just a second. The second uh, strategy that we're looking for, if that was about institutions, is we're looking at students themselves and that transition from high school to college and that transition from some college back to college after they've dropped out. And the idea here is that if you want to build, ensure that you have equitable graduation rates, you have to make sure that you also have equitable enrollment rates. So it's making sure that students of color from underrepresented groups are in fact enrolling in college and making the right choices. They're going to the kind of college that's likely to graduate them and not saddle them with excessive debt. So the idea is how do we advise those students to make the right choices as they uh, transition to college or back to college if um, they ha have the means and the time to do so. Finally, we have something, this is really the heart of the, the webinar today, is aligning and strengthening the urban higher education ecosystem. This concept comes from the idea that um, if you're an elite student, or, um, and particularly if you're affluent, you might go um, across the state to a public flagship or across the country to a, a well-known uh, private institution. And when you get there, you've got a dorm, and you've got food in the cafeteria, you've got, of course, faculty, and you've got advisors, and you've got um, sports and social life, and often uh, fabulous career planning and support. And Often these students have the most resources at home and are very well prepared for college. But for lower income students and first generation students, they typically are going to college locally. They're going to the big institution, often a state institution, downtown in their big city, and that's where they're going to get their degree. They're going to go to a community college, but they don't get all those other services. So for example, a high school senior who's getting maybe three interviews lunch and a bus to school every day, when she decides to start college in the fall, She's no longer getting free and reduced lunch, so she has to find a thousand calories more a day, and she has no way to get to school because she doesn't have a car and she no longer has a free school bus. So you have issues like you know, transit, and you know, that they maybe are made they're ambivalent about their major and they take a major that's not likely to have a lot of jobs in their community. At the same time, the business community is saying, why don't we get more people who are majoring in some relevant field? And so the idea is could we get a community to act a little bit more aligned to support these students so that they are less likely to fall through the cracks and so that they can succeed in the same kind of way that an elite student might at an elite college. 
So um, this is how we're going to try and uh, show the video, and that will probably give you a better explanation of what we mean by urban higher education ecosystem. Edgar, can you run the video? Yep, we'll do. So I just, as a reminder, everybody, um, the audio is going to come out of your computer speaker. So you won't, if you're dialed in right now, you won't be here, be able to hear the audio through your phone. So turn up the volume on your computer and you'll be able to hear the video. And without further ado, here we go. a little bit better than I can uh, exactly what we're trying to do with the, uh, uh, with our work. Um, if we could go to the next slide, uh, this really illustrates sort of the longer term the kind of issues we're looking at on the, um, the urban education ecosystem. You can see the student is really at the center, and the idea is how could we get uh, the local chamber a local four-year school too is with all the work together to make this happen. Now on the next slide, uh, we're looking at some early takeaways from our work. We've been doing this for about three, three and a half years. And a couple of them um, I think are really useful for you to know first. Uh, this we got from David Grattre at the LA uh, Chamber. Each community is unique. And you know, and you know that, but that's something to always look at is that while you you might see a great idea, it may not translate exactly right to your community for a variety of reasons. Uh, Detroit has maybe two or three colleges within its city limits. Philadelphia has over 100. So you have already a very different context if you're working in Philadelphia versus Detroit. So there's, there's things that are going to make it a little bit different than what you do. Another one is that success requires both consistent engagement with and strong communication with your stakeholders. This is not just a one and done. This is something where you've got to sort of see the long game here and engage people long term. Another important thing is um, it's really, really uh, ultimately important to get local or, and or private philanthropy involved in this work. There are national funders like Cresby or Luna or the Gates Foundation, and we do what we can. But the people who are most going to come, uh, you know, be concerned with Oklahoma City or with Wichita or with Bend, Oregon, are going to be the people who live in that area, including the philanthropy that support it. Another thing is really important that um, that if you're going to have real movement, that some of the entities within your community are part of national networks. That might obviously be ACCE, like all of you, but it might be if your community college is part of achieving the dream, the nation's biggest reform network for community colleges. 
It's also important to look at these national networks, even if that's not in a network, for advice and for ideas and best in class practices. So the National College Access Network, which is leading in Indianapolis for its annual conference next week, Achieving the Dream, which meets in February in Washington next year. ACCE was just met in Long Beach this summer of the National League of Cities. These are all groups that are overlapping interests in this space, but with a special focus on nonprofits for college access, community colleges, chambers, or cities and their their uh, mayors and uh, their sort of city government. So there are different ways to approach this issue. Another thing that we've seen is important is success builds on success. So for example, Greg is going to talk in a minute about the work in Detroit. Um, when we started something called the Talent Dividend a few years ago, which by the way, Greg says is now up to $1,250 per capita if you increase your BA rate by a percentage point. We did that a few years ago. Um, there really wasn't a, quite a, a really strong network yet in Detroit, um, like you saw in some other cities like Los Angeles. But then they established one, and now they're um, doing even more because they've got a stronger network established. So these kinds of things, you know, when you, when you take that leap, you can really build from it. And then finally, FAFSA completion is really a quick win that can build confidence and momentum for your leadership and for the community as a whole. You can go from 35, 40% FAFSA completion rate among your high school seniors to 55, 60, 65, 70% in a year or two. There is nothing else in education that builds that quickly. So it's something you can really think about doing to get to build that confidence and momentum. Let's go to the next slide. So when you, if you're thinking about building a higher education ecosystem, there are several things I encourage you to keep in mind. First, think about equity. How do you ensure that everybody is uh, able to succeed in your community and no one's left behind, particularly communities that have historically been left behind, African Americans, Latinos, the Islanders, Native Americans in particular. Um, it's critical to get at least one higher education institution that serves a large number of, of uh, low-income students and middle-income students to be a partner in this work. It's great if you've got an elite college in your town, but that's not who typically serves your community directly. So you've got to think of that broader service institution. I would try to go for an early win so you can show that this work is making a difference. I would um, definitely try to partner with the community or private foundation, even if they can't give money or they're not sure. In invite them to your events, include them in your work. If your community college is not part of Achieving the Dream, see what you can do. Uh, you know, see if you can take a delegation to Achieving the Dreams conference to learn more about what they're doing uh, and bring your community college leadership. I would also bring some of your chamber leadership to LA, Austin, Dallas, of course here in Detroit, Huntsville. Check with ACCE and say, you know, is there a city you recommend that we might want to go to because it's kind of got the same kind of issues we do. But this, but it does, it provides an opportunity for your city to see what's truly possible um, because you can see another city that's already done it. Um, another issue is some people are going to say, what about technology? You know, aren't they all going to learn on their iPad soon? Well, technology is important and a lot of people are going to be using online education and other tools, but it's not the be all end all. It's not the ultimate solution. So I, I still think you need to focus on what can people do for people as opposed to a technology fix, although technology is a critical part of it. The other one is I would uh, take great ideas from others, steal ideas. If you hear something from Greg that you think you ought to be doing, I definitely do it. As far as I know, Greg has not patented these things in the Detroit <laughs> Chamber, so I think it's an um, open game. So definitely take whatever you can get. So um, if we go to the last slide, that pretty much is it for me. You know, if you're interested in learning more about Cresby, please visit our website, www.cresby.org. Follow us on Twitter at CresbyDo and subscribe to our newsletter, Every Dream Matters. So thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions later. Perfect. Thank you again, Bill, for that presentation. And I would like to pass the microphone over uh, to Greg. Thanks, Edgar, and uh, thanks to Bill for being here with me. Actually, we're doing this out of the chamber offices here together. Um, so just a, just a quick uh, level set for everybody. The Detroit Regional Chamber is the regional chamber for 11 counties for southeast Michigan. Uh, our core population is the, the tri-county area, Wayne, Oakland, and Macomb County, southeast Michigan, uh, about 5 million people in our metro. 
So very first slide there um, is our contribution to making you all feel good about yourself and where you stand with education attainment compared to us probably. Um, so given that first bullet point about the importance of attainment to regional economic prosperity, you see where we are as a state, 33rd out of 50. And as a metro region, we are 38th out of 50 for a percentage of adults with a bachelor's degree. So um, you know, we know our, our, we have our work cut out for us. Most of our focus here is on transition from high school to higher ed. Um, I'll get into, we aren't as focused on K-12 as an organization. We do that as part of a bigger collaborative, which I'll explain in a minute. But part of the message here is that our K-12 system in Michigan is not helping our situation any. Um, you know, we've been fairly stagnant in terms of achievement, while other states that have been lower performing are getting better faster. So, and, and, and our problems are not confined to, as many of the people like to blame them on, kind of low income or minority or urban uh, population. If you look at the, uh, our, our proficiency rates for our highest income students compared to high income students from other states, we're like 48th, 49th in many categories. So this is not a problem driven just by our low income population. So if you want to go on to the next slide, this just gives a little context for, you know, kind of given this evolving importance of attainment to economic prosperity, how we're kind of viewing this. So, and this is actually a, a slide from the, the Brookings Institute, and uh, but, but we're putting it into a lot of our presentations now. And kind of in the past, we really looked at economic development was driven by business attraction and trying to spur investment here and steal companies from other regions, you know, encourage growth, but also bring companies here from all over the world. So. We've, we're evolving to uh, a strategy that focuses more on, you know, what do you do to, to build the talent base? Because talent is what drives economic development now. And some regions of the country are very talent rich, but primarily because they, they attract talent from other parts of the country. If you look at Seattle or Boston, it's not necessarily that they do that much better job with their local talent than the rest of the country. They may or may not, but it's that they are attracting people from other places. But outside the coast and, you know, in the interior of the country, maybe Denver and Dallas, you know, most of the country is not attracting talent at scale. So for the rest of us, the Detroit's and the St. Louis and other places, we're really going to need to focus on how do we upskill our existing population and, and educate populations that have not traditionally been necessarily well served by, by our existing system. So if you go on to the next slide, this just gives an overview. I'm going to go into a lot of these programs individually, but just to give you a sense for how they're organized in our mind. So at the top you see we have a goal of getting to 60% attainment by 2030. Now as Bill talked about earlier, you know, post-secondary attainment in college we, we use interchangeably, but we mean high value certificates, associates, and bachelors. So right now as a state and a region we're at about 45%. We need to get to 60%. That means 570,000 more credentials in Southeast Michigan that we need between now and then. So um, I think we're growing at about a half a percentage a year. We need to grow, I'm sorry, we need, to, we need to grow basically six times faster than we are now in order to get to that. So doing what we've always done won't get us there. So underneath that, what you see three banners there, increasing access, ensuring success. What's labeled there is growing talent, but it's easier to think of as retaining talent. Think of that as a pipeline from left to right. So what are we doing to encourage access into post-secondary on the far left? And those are the initiatives that focus on that. In the middle are, what do we do to ensure that people who start some kind of post-secondary experience actually complete? It's a much bigger issue than many people realize. A lot of people think, hey, you get somebody into college, we can, you know, we can, we can applaud ourselves and move on to the next problem. Not the case at all. Um, you know, you really have to focus on improving outcomes with your post-secondary institution. And the last piece, for a place like Michigan and Detroit, we have to ensure that once you get people through those first two steps, that you're keeping them here. We know in the state of Michigan that 36% of our college grads leave the state within 12 months. So what do we do about that? All of those things are underpinned at the bottom by public policy. And so what do we do about public policy? So I'm going to dive into each of these buckets and what we're doing in these areas and then try to leave some time for some Q&A. So if you go on to the, the next slide, the first thing we're doing in the access phase is 
we are the administrator for the Detroit um, uh, Promise Scholarship. So this is very programmatic. So the other thing I want to make a point to, to address here is some of what I'm describing here, they're programs. We administer them. We have a fairly large staff for the Promise. We have a lot of people when you come our success coaches. And we're very hands-on to deal with individual students. Um, there are but, uh, the other things that we talk about, we're a convener. So, you know, we are trying to make the system work better. We aren't trying to necessarily run all aspects of the system. So I'll try and make that distinction as I go through here. But the first thing here, the promise, which was launched in 2013, it was actually kind of um, rebuilding, it was building on a, on, a, on a previous scholarship program that the chamber administered that was smaller, that was smaller in scope. So we now guarantee every student who graduates from high school in the city um, and lives in the city that they can go to a community college tuition free. And we do that on a last dollar basis. We require students to fill out the FAFSA form. We know that in which will entitle them to a Pell Grant. Pell, in most cases, is going to cover the full cost of community college. But in the, the noisy space around college and college debt, I know that, that's a fact lost on many students particularly in, when they're in high schools where they're not getting a lot of good information about what their options are after high school. So we're trying to simplify it and say, if you fill out the FAFSA form, you know, regardless of how much you get in Pell, we will make up any difference at any of our regional community colleges. So there's five community colleges that we send students to. Um, students who meet, and there's, there's no academic requirement for that. Uh, for students who meet a, uh, a set of academic requirements defined by our universities, three-point GPA and a 1060 or higher on the SAT, they can go to pretty much any public university in the state and a small but growing number of private institutions tuition-free. Um, and there it's the universities for the most part filling in after the, the, the Pell Grant. So we have some metrics on the left there and kind of the, the chamber's specific role on the right. So we staff that program. We send coordinators out into the high school to publicize the program. And we run the database that students um, register in. We do the paperwork to get them. They, they apply to college, but we are sending the list to the, to the colleges and universities. And then for our portion, they bill us one time. So we're not having to keep track of invoices for, you know, well over a thousand students. We get one invoice from Henry Ford College one invoice from Oakland Community College, one invoice from Wayne State University. Um, so that's our big play in college access in the city of Detroit. So this is just focused on the city, even though we're a regional entity. We were asked to take on this role when we did, so that's why we're focused there. You know, these numbers are not going to get us to the 60%, but we do think we can be part of changing the college-going culture in Detroit. So we look past the specific numbers. That we're, that, that we're serving here and looking at how do we contribute to an improved culture of higher ed. So go on to the next slide. What we're doing regionally in this space, one of the things is um, a kind of, so uh, Bill alluded to it, focused on FAFSA completion, it's kind of an early win. So we administer a, we call it the race to the FAFSA line. So Michigan actually does fairly decently in terms of FAFSA completion. But we sponsor a contest with all of the high, any of the high schools in our tri-county area are eligible. We provide support to uh, those high schools in terms of resources to help um, high school uh, counselors instruct people in filling out the FAFSA. We have donated prizes to high schools that, you know, the, the less large high school that's improved FAFSA completion, most innovative approaches, um, things like that. And we, you know, we're drilling down. We haven't moved the needle a whole lot in the last two years in terms of total completion. We're trying to drill, drill a little bit deeper this year and really looking at some high schools in each of our counties where we know there's a large eligible, you know, income-wise, there should be a large eligible population, but where we can look and see that FAFSA rates are, fair, completion rates are fairly low. The other thing we do as part of this initiative is, you know, in partnership with others, we do workshops to train counselors and things like that. But we also, you can get FAFSA completion data on every school in your, in your area uh, every two weeks. So you can see from the time that the FAFSA window opens, what percentage of students in a particular high school have completed. And we kind of share that information 
with everybody in our network so people can see and monitor progress and hopefully kind of uh, create friendly competition to encourage greater completion. But it's just one way to make people aware of, you know, people get overwhelmed with the whole discussion around college debt. A lot of people don't understand that, you know, a Pell Grant can be a pretty good, you know, it can pay for community college and it's a good foundation to begin funding a university education there. So the next, um, next piece of college access that we're involved in, we, and this is much more of a convener role, um, but uh, we were designated a talent hub by the Lumina Foundation. And our particular area of focus, so, you know, we identified that we have a higher than, much higher than average population of adults with some college but no credential in Southeast Michigan. And if you look at the number, it's 691,000 people in our region. So there's lots of reasons that people, um, it's about a quarter of the population, adult population. There's a lot of reasons people start but don't complete. So we're starting to look at these barriers one by one and address them. So one of the things that we found was that a fairly high percentage, something like a quarter of people who had started but had not completed, were unable to re-enroll in school because they had outstanding debt with the institution that they had last attended, which meant that they couldn't re-enroll there until they had paid off that debt, or their transcripts were held, which meant they couldn't enroll anywhere else. So we, one of our uh, partnering universities, Wayne State, came up with a really innovative program where they forgive, it's a fairly small amount, $1,500 of existing debt for students who re-enrolled. And so they launched that uh, about you know, 18 months or so ago. We announced the program. They had a really um, strong response to that. They had people saying, look, I owe you, Wayne State, I owe you $3,000. If you'll forgive $1,500, I'll pay $1,500 that I owe you up front and then Wayne State forgives $500 of debt per semester that they're enrolled. Um, and they had, they had over 100 people actually enroll under the debt forgiveness program last year. And as a result, we started to convene our other higher eds in the region to see if we couldn't create a regional strategy around this. So we were able to announce um, at the end of April that one other university and two community colleges would be part of this debt forgiveness collaborative. So we announced that. We created a central intake process um, here at the chamber electronically, and we have a person on staff who actually is now working with over 250 individuals who have expressed a desire to re-enroll or enter higher ed. These are all older adults, um, and, and so we're facilitating that enrollment. We then just got a grant from the Ralph C. Wilson Foundation, which is local here, um, to start to figure out how we could build on that infrastructure. So two big things we want to do is create more community infrastructure, more community resources for people who go to, you know, we have an organization in town, the Detroit Parent Network, or the United Way, or other community groups, you know, where these folks live. So unlike the high school population where they're kind of, you can find them, this adult population is spread out all over the place. And so we have to go find them. So we are looking to partner with higher ed and partner with their, um, their existing counseling core to create an, a, an agnostic advising core to go out and just help people navigate going back to higher ed. So again, on the right is our, our, our focus and as the chain was well there. So on to the next, uh, next page there. So this gets into the student success space. So one of the things that we found with our, um, our Detroit Promise population going to community college was that in any given year, 35 to 40 percent of the students who had started in the previous year were returning for a second year. Most, you know, the, the results for community college, the completion rates are, are um, not widely understood, but they're fairly low. I think for the city of Detroit, your odds of completing a degree, I think there's only 6, 14 percent of students who started at a community college ever finished any kind of credential um, if you were from the city of Detroit and started a community college, this is prior to the promise. So early on, we saw that, you know, and we had we, we worked with our community colleges to ensure supports were in place. They were, in fact, in place, but what we found was that our students who struggled just didn't, you know, they all require the support that community colleges provide, typically require the students to take the initiative to seek them out. And what we found is our students didn't do that. So we, uh, reached out, identified a national best practice through an organization called the MDRC, and they helped us adapt a program out of New York called ASAP, 
Um, it's not an exact replication, it's an adaptation, but we have this intrusive advising model where we now have seven coaches who are on community college campuses working with our students, and we pay the students $50 a month if they attend two coaching sessions one-on-one -on -one with our coaches, so that our coaches can be very proactive in kind of building those relationships, helping students before they get in trouble, reassuring them that they belong, or helping them connect to, res to resources on campus. Again, our goal here isn't, you know, the number of students that will impact isn't going to change, get us to our 60% goal, but we've been identified by, at least based on the early outcomes, as a national best practice by the MDRC. And now as the state is considering the statewide community college promise, they're really looking strongly um, at the model we've created to see, is this something we can scale up? So we've been able to kind of be a, a I think a pioneer in, in, in administering, bringing this kind of intervention to the region, administering it, getting some early demonstrable results, and now working with the state to figure out what's the strategy for getting this, not to several hundred students, but to tens of thousands, so that we can have a, a, the kind of impact that will get us to our goal. So that's the, uh, that's, and that's all related to the Detroit Promise. Um, so the next slide, Again, so how do we scale up these interventions? So one of the other things that we will be launching hopefully in December is we've been working all along in, in a convening role with our K-12 community, with our community college presidents, and our universities. Now, Michigan and the Detroit region are unique to the country in that we don't have the state office of higher education that many of you have. So we don't have a natural convener who's kind of looking at, out for the interests of students as a whole who are bringing together K-12 community colleges and, and universities. So this was really a unique space and our higher ed and K-12 partners have accepted us as a kind of a, um, a neutral convener and, and a problem solver and they like the call of the business community speaking to the importance of higher ed and, and you know regarding their needs without being as self-interested as say the university community might look if they go out and just tout the importance of for your education. So they really formed a partnership with us and really been willing to kind of come to the table to do some innovative things. So we really kind of took an idea um, that we first saw from Cleveland where the mayor there convened the partners and they looked at what are the graduation rates, you know, post-secondary completion rates for Cleveland students compared to students from the rest of the region. And what strategies do they put in place? So we are working on data sharing agreements where we get really granular level data um, first for city students, but it'll be across the whole region so we can look at what are the outcomes at X institution for first year, um, or, uh, first generation low income students. How many of them complete 24 credits in the first year? What are their GPAs? How many eventually graduate? We'll have a dashboard available to the community. We'll have, you know, annual updates and we'll be convening partners to work on strategies to what's our goal for improving. And what, at what rate do we need to improve to get to our 60% goal? So our role is the convener and the holder of data, but you know we convene the leaders and, and we've walked through probably an 18 month process to get them to the point where we'll be able to sign agreements and unveil this to the public in a few months. Uh, next, next slide. So this gets into some of this I'm going to speed through. You know, what do we do to you know retain that talent that we eventually graduate? So we've just launched. So this is an area where we didn't have a lot of, we didn't have an ongoing focused effort to keep our talent, the 36% who are leaving the state within 12 months of graduation. So we have a website, it's called Let's Detroit, I invite you to Google it, go and look at it. But it is a platform, it's a web platform, but it is really designed to be much more than a website where you can get information on kind of live, work, play. We recruited over 150 ambassadors to kind of be resources for people. So you can go to that site and you can pose a specific question and say, hey, I'm looking to move to the region, you know, I'm from another area, where should I look to live? Our, our field research really indicated that, you know, the demographic, the young educated demographic we're trying to reach doesn't care about flip websites, they, they really are almost hostile to marketing campaigns. They really want to hear from their peers. So we have enlisted their peers and built functionality into this site that lets their peers communicate about the region and lets them connect directly to them. And I can give you some specific examples about how that's worked, but we are now unveiling a campus strategy where we're going on campus and trying to get young people um, connected to 
this, uh, this platform and engage with our ambassadors before they graduate so we can connect to the region in a meaningful way um, before they graduate. You can scroll go quickly through the rest of these slides. We have some very industry specific things we do around the automotive cluster here. Um, you know, as we transition from the kind of the, the car companies that our parents all knew to autonomous electrified vehicles and kind of the, the brains we need to develop that, that industry will go to where the talent to develop it um, coalesces and we're fighting to be that talent. So we do some very industry focused initiatives around that. And that's led by our Mish Auto team, which is a separate entity housed here at the chamber. And we collaborate with them, um, but you know, they, that's our more, most industry specific initiative. We don't get into a ton of industry specific um, and workforce initiatives in what we do here. So here I go next. Um, this is just a list of programs that we are either affiliated with or run here at the chamber. It's a way to engage talent. It's not specifically designed to keep talent here, but we kind of try and pull all these things together. Um, we're pulling our leadership Detroit alumni, over 2,000 people together to kind of focus on interacting with our Let's Detroit audience and the ambassadors there to figure out how we leverage that. But, you know, we just try and pull all these together and, and be mindful of what we do to focus on talent retention. And the next slide, um, uh, we, so we have a program where we, we, have a, we have a large charter sector here in Michigan, particularly in Detroit. They are, these charter schools are governed by independent boards and we haven't had a systematic way of identifying and recruiting talent. So we've taken on that role. Our authorizers um, who create the charter schools actually pay us to do it. It was an initiative that we've had in the past. We just relaunched it at their behest and getting it off the ground. But it's a way to recruit people from the business sector, provide them with an orientation about what they should look for and questions to ask if they serve on a charter board, and then facilitate placement on those boards. And then I think just kind of flip through the next couple of slides. The last thing, our policy, we coordinate with our policy team. Um, you haven't heard me talk a lot about K-12 policy, and that's because there's an initiative called Launch Michigan, which was really spearheaded by a sister business organization at the state level. We're very engaged, although not we are one of many voices at the table, but that's really where we're focused on kind of that agenda, that policy agenda that has to happen. But we've been advocates for our Michigan Merit High School curriculum, um, maintaining high statewide standards and, and an aligned assessment, and then really kind of focused on um, a, a more robust post-secondary uh, attainment agenda, really supporting the governor's initiatives around the Michigan Reconnect, which is modeled on Tennessee Reconnect or Michigan Opportunity, which would be a statewide, uh, either free community college or um, some states, more state support, need-based support um, for students interested in four-year opportunities. And then we supported initiatives at the state level for promoting the skilled trades. So I know that's a lot pretty quickly, um, but I'll leave it at that. Oh, lastly, we are forming a CEO council to kind of oversee all of our efforts. So we've had businesses engaged in a lot of our efforts at the program level, and obviously we have a chamber board, but we have not, we've done a better job, frankly, engaging our higher ed and K-12 partners than the business community in a systematic way. And so we are just forming the CEO council that will oversee kind of all these initiatives and help us, I think, bring more cohesion and alliance to what we're doing. So with that, I'm opening up to uh, Edgar, whatever you want to take us next with questions. All right. Perfect. Well, thank you again, Greg, for that great presentation. We do have some uh, questions already, so we'll move forward to the Q&A portion of this webinar. So the first question that I have is, in the Detroit program, is there any connection between employer needs and student education? In other words, are we encouraging students to go into careers of greater need locally? I guess this question is directed to you, Greg. Yeah, so I would say we have our, so our greater, well, acknowledge that there's a need to do that, and we intend to get into that more deeply, especially with this adult work that we're building out. Um, but our focus has really been more around just getting students into the post-secondary pipeline and through, and, you know, and to some extent, the market's going to sort some of that out. Part of the reason we haven't focused as heavily on that is there's another organization in town called the Workforce Intelligence Network that aligns our community colleges and our federally funded workforce investment boards 
and they get terrific labor market information data. They focus on more of the short-term training and aligning that and getting grants to create specific training programs around that. So that said, with the higher ed work we're doing, we're launching a large-scale survey of our employer members to really determine more about what they need. And then that whole area around niche auto is heavily focused on what the automotive needs. So we haven't done as much work in that area. We will get more involved, but we are not getting into the granular level of, oh, we need X number of people with this exact credential, and what's the backward pipeline into that? I, last note of caution on that is before you go too down, too far down that path, look at your local labor market projection for what people thought would be the most in-demand careers from 10 years ago, when people start this pipeline, and, and what the in-demand careers are now, and you know, our ability to, to, to forecast that is more limited than people often assume. So I, I just be a little careful how far down that path you get. <laughs> people are not with it. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. So the next question I have is uh, directed to you, Greg, as well. What is the involvement of chamber members? Do they provide internships for students, other interaction between students and chamber members and slash local businesses? So we have we've dabbled in the notion of uh, for our promised students specifically um, internships. You know, we, we have not been able to make that work in a robust way. I'll, I'll tell you one of the things we learned on the, in the Detroit Promise program with, on the success side is that when we started to see that our students were, were really failing miserably at community college, you know, we tried some kind of locally designed interventions and assigned somebody to it part time and we tried to work with the colleges and we didn't get very far. It wasn't until we put serious resources in, into a national and adapted a national best practice that we really started to make a dent in that problem. And so right now, we just don't have the bandwidth to do a really, I think, quality internship program. So, you know, we are working with a couple of our lead employers as, you know, our downtown and midtown areas are really growing very robustly. And it's a challenge for our employers to find talent in the city. So, you know, to some extent, the people that live in a neighborhood three miles from downtown aren't they don't have the opportunity, you know, they don't have a pipeline into the opportunities that are being created, and, and we want the Promise program to be part of that. And so, we, you know, we have this large captive audience of students that we want to feed into them, but it takes a lot of infrastructure and a lot of resources to create an internship placement program. So, we are looking at some national models and whether we can partner with somebody else to do that, or fundraising to the point where we have at least a full-time position to do that. But we do have this, this this large cadre of students and four-year universities that we think are, will be of interest to our employers, and it's on the to-do list. But again, you know, it, unless you're really willing to go all in, it's hard to do well with very limited resources and focus. Thank you, Craig. Um, so the next question is also directed to you, Craig. How are you engaging businesses in the FAFSA completion workshop work? So, so there's, in the beginning, what we've done is we engaged a couple of businesses in providing um, prizes for schools and, and some resources. So buses for, um, uh, we had some buses for uh, students to attend. We had, a, we had a, a, a theater owner donate and make kind of entertainment centers. So they had a 24-hour party for a high school that had the highest you know, rate of completion um, improvement. What we're the next kind of phase of this that we want to 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 you know, to, to uh, unroll is explaining the importance of FAFSA completion to the employees of companies where we know there's you know employers that have a lot of lower income uh, lower income workforce whose students could benefit. So some of the work, the money we want to get that we want to deploy from the Ralph Wilson. Foundation. One, we want to employ, we want to work with employers to kind of really help them fashion programs around not just tuition reimbursement, but tuition support and best practices, and allowing us and our kind of network to come in and do lunch and learn. So at the same time, you're talking to to you know em employers about 
can we come in and do a lunch and learn on how your employees can take advantage of our network to re-enroll in higher ed or enroll in higher ed. We also want to talk to them about strategies to get their students to fill out the FAFSA so that they can take advantage of, of that. So that's part of our strategy with where we want to go with the Ralph Wilson uh, funding that we got, and it'll be kind of tied into uh, Bill and I are just coming from a meeting where we're talking about two generation strategies. So this will be one of those two generation strategies. So we've had limited employment engagement. We've gotten them to, so we've sold sponsorships, so we put their name on some of the things we've done. So we've raised about $15,000 or so to help pay for the intern and some of our programming. And, the, and then, you know, probably about $25,000 worth of um, in time value uh, for the prizes we've distributed to the high schools. But we'll take this next step and kind of lunch and learn at employee locations. All right. Perfect. Thank you, Greg. Um, and with that, um, I'm going to begin starting closing off this webinar. So I know we have a couple more minutes left, but before I take the microphone over and explain a little bit more about ACC resources available, um, can you, if you have any closing, I guess, remarks, Bill and Greg, uh, you would like to give, I'll begin with you, Bill, if you have anything to say. Sure. Just, I think that um, if, if you can't already tell, um, obviously the, the experience that here in Detroit with Greg and his team suggests that chambers can be um, really, really effective catalytic leaders in their community to get to really start things and to get them going. And so I encourage all of you to think about that role. If you can build partnerships like Greg has with local colleges that serve your local students as well as with uh, nonprofit organizations like the Detroit College Access Network in our case here in Detroit, you can really make a huge difference. So I strongly encourage you to think about um, uh, upping your game in this area. And uh, this is Greg, I would just I would just add, you know, Chambers should be really aware. Dig into the com the, the the data on completion rates for the post secondary institutions that serve your local communities. I think you'll find it pretty eye opening. Um, you know, it's something the data really wasn't readily available for a long time, uh, and so it just was not an area of focus. You know, and I think a lot of higher ed institutions almost prided themselves on, you know, it's our job to kind of weed people out and only give you the, you know, leave you with the, the best performing candidates. But, you know, there's not a pathway now for, for family sustaining wages, you know, for people who don't have post-secondary credentials. And as regions, you need people who weren't graduating in the past. To, um, to graduate now. And then lastly, uh, Edgar, I think I sent you the link to that video. There's a 12-minute video that was done on our Detroit Promise PASS program, which is the success initiative we've developed for our community college students. I encourage you to take a look at it. I, I will tell you there's no shortcuts to post-secondary success for students from hard to serve populations. It's a real grind, but it's necessary work if you're gonna, in, if you're gonna improve the completion rates in your community. Perfect. Thank you both. Um, and with that, I just want to say thank you again to all of our wonderful speakers who participated in, in today's webinar. I just want to go over a couple of things before we conclude um, today. We do have a new ACC toolkit resource guide called a Chamber of Commerce Guide for Developing a Higher Education Ecosystem. So if you look at your, your little access panel and you click on the handouts tab, you'll be able to um, download that uh, piece of material and it is interactive in the sense that you can click on the different links throughout the toolkit to read more on how to get um, engaged in this space and read more about some of the chamber initiatives that are highlighted within the toolkit. Um, and if you would like to join the Education Talent Development Division, meaning you want to be opted in uh, to the division, uh, and, or have any questions or like to schedule a call with your peers, please feel free to reach out to me at ecastillo at acc.org. One of the benefits of opting in to the division is receiving our monthly ETD News to Know, which features a few news items and resources that can be helpful to your business and education communities. Additionally, we also share a couple of different chamber initiatives led by your peers. So that email did go out, I believe, yesterday. So if you missed it and or you believe you're not receiving those emails, feel free to reach out to me after this webinar and I'll make sure you'll um, start getting um, those emails. 
So with that, oh, and lastly, this webinar is recorded and you will receive an email uh, about maybe tomorrow, the day after. Thanking you for being part of this webinar. You'll receive a copy of the recording of today's webinar along with the this exact presentation, um, the link to the, the video that Bill Moses shared today and the link that Greg Handel um, referenced to today as well too. So you will have access to that, to that um, within the next about 24 to 48 hours. So with that, I just wanna thank everyone who participated in today's webinar and I would like to wish everyone a great rest of your day. Thank you, everybody.